Come on down for Price is Right. Okie dokie. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Don't get bamboozled. <laughs> I'm Ozone Ocean, and with me is Baines and Pit Bays. But Baines is going to be the captain of this quack cast. The captain. He's got the steering wheel in his greedy little sweaty hands, and he's going to take You'll swap many a poop deck. He's going to take it places. It's, uh, you know, it's pretty scary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but before we get into that, um, cause this is going to be the dialogue quack cast, uh, by the way. But before we get into that, we're going to... Talking uh, about talking! <laughs> we are. <laughs> we're going to introduce the uh, the featured comic. And the featured comic for the week was... Now, it's a feature I did, so I should know it. Okay, it's uh, King's Club. So, I'm going to talk about King's Club now. Hello, I'm Ozone Ocean, and my feature for the week was King's Club by Amelia P. Kriana is still a schoolgirl, but she's already a foot soldier in the Mafia. It's the family business, and she's part of the family. Things are about to get very real for her. No spoilers. Two hard-bitten professional mercenaries are sent in to clean up the mess. It's gonna get bloody. This is a noir action thriller story. It's tense and immersive. The art is amazing and pro. American comic book style. Digital. Full color. This will be an exciting story to follow. King's Club is a relatively newcomer to Drunk Duck. And it's updating uh, quite regularly and frequently, with a lot of interesting things happening. It has a very 1970s aesthetic to a lot of it, which is gives it quite an air of cool. One of the kings, which is a, a top-grade mercenary, King of Spades, he has a bit of an Elvis appearance and look and expression that gives it uh, quite a nod to pop culture. I love that. It's uh, pretty fun. The uh, top-grade mercenaries are named after the the kings in the suits of cards and so all these mercenaries are sort of named after uh, suits depending on what they specialize in you know clean up or um, uh, elimination or whatever so it's pretty cleverly done and really really well thought out and the higher the rank they are the higher they are in the suits so you can tell things are about to get real when two kings come in anyway enjoy King's Club by Amelia P rated M and that was uh, the feature Kings Kings Club Kings Club that's it okay so and uh, the featured music this week by our resident composer Mr. Gum Wallace he has given us the featured music to Kings Club what a coincidence and it was pure coincidence amazing <laughs> wow yeah. Oh, wow. I love it when synchronicity like office. that happens. Yeah. yeah. So Somebody call James Randy. <laughs> <laughs> we want that money. We want it. Yeah. So uh, the King's Club, this is modern mafia movie soundtrack. Starting off eerie and atmospheric and then ramping up the cool and bombastic. This traditional theme here bolstered by hard gritty techno rock edge so take it away gum wallace Thank you. 
that was King's Club, uh, Gun Wallace's music. Uh, and Amelia P was, of course, the, the artist, which I would have told you about. In the, Very nice. Uh, in everything nice like comic. that. Yeah, it's, it's cool looking. I love that one of the characters looks like Elvis. Awesome. It's really cool. So if uh, James Randi pays a million dollars for the proof of psychic powers, right? That's yes. it. So yeah. if, maybe like a, an odd coincidence, you think we could get like a thousand bucks or something? We check <laughs> yeah, it. yeah. Maybe he'll meet yeah. us halfway. It's got to be worth something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't see why not. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. Money's just sitting there. It's only money. Spread it around, James. Yeah. Yeah, yeah dude. Come on. Bastard. You'll be dead soon. Yeah. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> we need it for the, our power of chi okay so dialogue yeah. we were going to talk about a little dialogue yeah well actually we've all heard of monologues oh yeah monologues they're old hat we've all heard of crowds just screaming incoherently yeah so but nobody's that. ever heard of dialogue no I don't know <laughs> I, I didn't think this through preach know. brother preach <laughs> <laughs> No, so this is a thing about dialogue, and um, <clears throat> I shared some advice about like how to figure out the dialogue when you're writing your scene, um, if you're having trouble with it. Um, of course, if you know what's sort of the overall of what's going on in your story, uh, you know what your character wants, big picture, you know what they're sort of, what's holding them back, what kind of you know wound they have, or what kind of limitation they have like like what the character is all about kind of thing and then you know the same as far as what they want in the scene so you know what one character wants and you know what's in their way so to figure out your dialogue once you know all that stuff is to do, do bad dialogue first to get yourself going okay. um, that that was the point of the of this article um just hang on hmm. one moment i'm sorry that's really cool bad dialogue first yeah and so bad dialogue would be and I write it all the time in my final comic it's there way too much but a bad dialogue would be for a character to just outright state what they're what they want yeah so they say what they're feeling or thinking and they say what they want and then whoever whatever's in the way says whoever's in the way says you know why they're in the way I guess kind of thing Right, everyone's open huh. about everything, so it's it's none of this. Uh, right, it's like straight. It's exactly yeah. Everyone's open about everything. They say it right out, outright, yeah. right out, whatever the expression is. I am a bad guy. I am a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get into this room. I don't. I'm gonna block you because I guess that's how it would work. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, huh. yeah. You're a sexy you woman, and I'm attracted you. to you. <laughs> okay. uh, then you have to rewrite you know you have to bury that stuff under you know uh, and I talk about how often people don't say what they're actually thinking they almost never do say exactly what they're thinking of course or feeling um, yeah well, let me see uh, where do I go from there oh and I like my favorite dialogue I've written and a lot of my favorite dialogue that I've seen I remember them talking about this on Seinfeld, one of the actors talking about like the characters like never stated how they felt or what they wanted, which is pretty unusual for a sitcom at the mm. time. Uh, they would almost always lie like, and they would literally say the opposite of what they're feeling. Oh. Like if someone was scared, they would say, you know, I'm, I'm not scared. No, I'm not. It would be like saying the opposite. And my favorite stuff that I've written in the comic was where the characters are saying the opposite of what they're actually feeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then hopefully strict. readers figure it out. When you look at comments, and they often do, I've noticed that they, people know. People are smart. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when I can have characters hiding their true intentions, lying or denying, the scenes are much better. And when readers comment and say, okay, yeah, that's what I just said, so... That's the basic idea. And then I asked people, how do you approach writing dialogue in your comics? Any thoughts on what makes good or bad dialogue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I, I like that uh, the whole misdirection thing. Um, I use it too sometimes. It's uh, it's not hard to do. You just like do a character like obviously smiling and then saying something that that's uh, cruel or you know sad or something like that, and that's gives that whole friction. You've you've got that energy right there. You've got that potential, so you can you can do that so easily. Such a good good tool to do that, or you know, body yeah. language and all that kind of stuff. Like, character. yeah, if you can get the facial expression. I mean, some are are easier. Some are really tough, like a sarcastic smile, or like, certain things are, are tougher. Sarc- yeah. sarcasm is very tricky to pull off on a page. Yeah, mm. very. Lying is 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 really easy because. Mm-hmm. Um, You've obviously just got to show the character doing something, you know, doing something, and then the next page you show them, you know, lying about it. <laughs> and it works really well because people respond to that. People become engaged in, in that kind of stuff. In in lies, that's a, that's like, you know, you're complicating things even more. I'm just talking about right. my own bum now, but uh, I like that. <laughs> Maybe we should read out what some of our contributors told us. So, oh, the contributors. The contributors. <laughs> I'm developing new, pronun- new pronunciations. Pronunciation. Pron- yeah, pronunciations. So, Bain- Bravo 1102 oh. of Sword of Kings fame. Sword and of many Kings? Other I thought it was King Sword. Oh, I <laughs> it's the sword king. <laughs> an, an important part of therapy, he says, is building the life skills to be able to express needs, wants, and desires clearly. And part of that is expressing your feelings in an I statement. Oh. But that's therapy. So being conscious of that uh, it, uh, might be easier to write about people who aren't that self-aware. Yes, characters should not always be that self-aware, especially if they're in those uh, high-pressure situations that we you know, people want to read about. Yeah. He goes on, unless it is unless in a classroom or giving a speech, people also don't indulge in long-winded ex- exposition. In fact, most conversation is not in sentences, but you have critics demanding grammar in something that, by its very nature, is intrinsically ungrammatical. Mm-hmm. Wow. Sometimes you wonder if these types ever had a real face-to-face conversation or ever bothered <laughs> to pay attention to one. But things have to be explained, and without benefit of narration, you're stuck with conversation and expository speechifying. And making that narrative chore into an actual flow into a natural flow of words is good dialogue. When it feels like you're overhearing someone talk as opposed to sitting in a lecture hall, the writer has succeeded. For great examples, read The God Strain. Long pages full of explanation, but it never feels like it. Yeah, God Strain is uh, is very good at uh, exposition through text. It is tricky, though, because you can't be too naturalistic in dialogue in comics or writing in general because it's on a page. It's With actors, you could do it. Like if you're doing a play or a movie, you could do naturalistic dialogue, but you can't really do it on a page that easily because it's a different kind of format. It doesn't work as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a balance. I think that's what Bravo is saying. It's it's a bit of a balance. Yeah. And it's, but I, I like it, though. You know, you, you realise that people don't speak in speechified ways naturally, but... It's it's a good way, it's a good excuse to be able to uh, indulge in giving people kind of speechified ways of talking because you're allowed to do that in comics and writing. So go for it, be Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that's interesting. Yeah, um, there are techniques you use to. Uh, to make dialogue more natural if you want. Do you guys ever do more naturalistic dialogue? Never. It's always... <laughs> seriously, always sort of slightly cartoony. Well, Bones does a lot of grunting and stuff like that because he doesn't have to really... He he is someone who should not 
talk about things overly much because that would be out of character. So you can't really have yeah. talk about stuff too much. Tread has a very specific way of talking, so he can't do that kind of thing either. It, so you've left it to the side characters like Igor and all that kind of stuff. Gretchen well, he doesn't really ex- do it. explain anything either. They don't really. They don't, but they they do in that they they talk about way more stuff than Bones ever does. I think they have more lines than he does. In I, if they talk, they talk more than Bones. I don't know. Does. Shut A up! You're bit, just but... the creator. <laughs> you don't even <laughs> read the comic. <laughs> I've read every single page. Shut up. <laughs> have not you just you're just a poser just a liar (laughs) and so Baines your characters are also they're in a sitcom style comic so you don't you wouldn't ever do naturalistic dialogue that just would not be your thing though would it no a lot of it is sort of like I I like the quips one liners the bon mots is that (laughs) the right word (laughs) <laughs> no, the little, uh, yeah, the little, uh, the wry comebacks and the, the this is and the that's and this sort of speechifying about, you know, movies, I guess, or whatever. Um, yeah. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's naturalistic. I do, I do try to avoid the like obvious setup joke thing where like I see a lot of TV shows that like, not necessarily comedies, but other TV shows where someone will ask a question that makes no sense out of the context of a, of a quip. Like, it's set up for the quip. Yeah. It's like, why, like, if someone wasn't expecting a quip, why, like, it's such a, a nonsensical question to ask. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It was... uh, I can't think of an example offhand, but yeah, that's, I try to, I try to avoid that. Um, but yeah, it's pretty... I'd say it's fairly artificial language. It's kind of to move the story forward or to sort of express comedy or, you know, to be amusing or whatever. Yeah. I've got a post here in in the the thing, and I say, um, interesting explanation of the process. So compliments to you, of course. Um, I approach it, I approach it, uh, dialogue pretty instinctively by the seat of my pants my pants pants not pants 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 Irene <laughs> P-O-N-C-E yeah. I'm a pants <laughs> <laughs> such a funny word <laughs> so sometimes I have a character emoting or acting a different way to what they're saying and so that looks like they're hiding something uh, but my main dialogue rule is to minimize things right down so they don't cover up too much art because I'm the mm. I just want my art to be the main thing. So I try and yeah. try and slim yeah. stuff down. So I write stuff that moves things along and gets the point, gets the point of the scene across. So those are very important things, obviously. The the dialogue isn't just there to, uh, you know, to... Like as as candy floss, it's not there just to co- and accompany the art. It's got to have a purpose. So I, I do that, but when it comes to actually putting it on the comic page, I simplify it down as best I can. So I think of it like a problem in physics. You know, where the whole point is to get to the the, the tiniest simple equation. You know, like EMC squared means ten ten blackboards of equations, but they've simplified it down just to that, and that's what my process is for dialogue I I'll have it as simple as yeah. possible so, I think I pretty much do the I same thing that. okay yeah because I mean if, if you think about it from the thing that web comics are constrained by especially if you're just updating you know one page every update which is what the vast majority of people do um, then you don't have the luxury of be of of an explanation being drawn out over an issue or something like that because it works the same way say a tv show does or something you know you might have a long overarching story but within the confines of one episode or one issue or one page or however much you're putting you're putting out at once there has to be some kind of 
thing, even small, that happens, or some something that's given from the page. You know what I mean? That compels you to continue on with with whatever you're stitching together overall. For, I mean, yeah. for the most part. So, like when you have a page and you have all these things you want to express on it, um, you know, the best thing to do then is typically is to make the dialogue is you know, to the point as possible, um, at least when you're in the, the kind of, of, of skill level of, of me and Oz and stuff where our, you know, we're kind of, I mean, people like Tangerine and stuff like that, she can make longer dialogue because she, she that's where she puts most of her, her effort and most yeah. of her um, expression and stuff like that, you know. But uh, yeah, so it, it, it could be detrimental to not, get to the point, which people are probably saying to me right now, like, get to the point. Well, I am. I'm just not <laughs> fucking listening, so. Uh, yeah, sometimes you can't. Sometimes it it takes a bit of uh, explanation. Sometimes it's impossible to uh, to be brief. It's, that yeah. happens. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. Like, without explanation. But you at least want to give some kind of at least, like, inkling to like say for example um when i have that that kind of i think it's like it, it's supposed to be like four or five pages one of the pages got cut off my comic because sometimes i don't know they get dropped for some reason but um like that that part where tread is kind of giving his giving his backstory which i still find kind of rickety i'm not sure if i'm glad that i put that in there but uh, it was kind of an itch to scratch cool. but he, oh, thank you. Um, I'm just not sure if he would have done that, but uh, anyway, um, when he starts to tell the story, it's kind of alluded to, like at the end of the first page where it happens, where he's about to. It he's going into it, and then the next page, he has given kind of the a little explanation of where the Bunkerians came from. And then after that, like it kind of each page is hooking up more to where, who he is and his backstory. So it's kind of climbing up this hill. Um, yeah. Right. But okay. you know, like each page kind of takes care of a segment of it. I should say. Yeah. Like a segment yeah, of yeah. It. yeah. 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 So, anyway. so you don't cover it all in one single page. You, you build on it. And yeah. that's the way of doing it. Yeah, you have to. People can't absorb that much in one page. Like, if you're trying to tell the whole story or too big of a chunk of story, how are they supposed to be locked in kind of to the moment? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because then if it's too short, that's a problem. But also, like, mm. if it's too long and you have, like, three pages, four pages explaining the same thing, <laughs> where there's no progression, then over time, especially if you're not updating um, regularly and there's long pauses between the updates, people lose the rest of what's going on. People lose the rest of the story and shit. So I'm, I guess what I'm saying is right. keep in mind yeah, your right. update schedule with the dialogue that you're creating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it's a good point, yeah. That's that's a good point, yeah. You don't long story short, your, uh... but... Mm. When you edit that, Oz, can you like edit out the rest of the shit that I said and just make it sound like I just said that? <laughs> Fucking, Jesus Christ, case in point, dude. <laughs> you come to the reduction of of the whole thing. Beautiful. <laughs> well, next up we have Mr. Bravo again. Um, Bones, would you like? Should to... do it again. I didn't do a voice last time. Oh, you don't do have the Bravo to. Bravo voice. All right. Bravo continues, every advance in the history of mathematics has been about reducing the terms of a complex computation. From simple algebra and geometry to calculus, each is a shorthand method for doing what would previously fill whole chalkboards. So, uh, yes, yeah, so he's responding to you, what you said about that. Yeah. So dialogue could be seen as distilling down a complex narrative into a handful of words. Keep it short and simple, unless the character is one who talks too much. <laughs> Characterization, yeah, that's a good point. Characterization can come before brevity. 
but then you you can always show the long-winded character getting cut off in mid-sentence just to keep things moving. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's a classic joke, too. You have the long-winded character, you introduce them with this huge spiel that goes on and on, and but after that, you don't want to bore the audience by doing that, so you cut them off every time because the audience knows what's happening or knows what to expect. So they imagine him going on and on and on while the story cuts to someone else or someone cuts him off mid-sentence and that makes it funny so that's a, that's a good technique to do I love that kind of stuff I think when we did our play we had one of the characters who was uh, going on and on and on like that <laughs> right and it's, it's great fun to write those things because you just write blather like you have <laughs> someone explaining like mansplaining over and over and over some simple thing it is what it is because it is this way and I believe it to be so and if it wasn't so then how would it be otherwise these are the things you have to realise <laughs> <laughs> just keep on and on it's so good. much fun <laughs> uh, so next up we have Mrs. Kim Luster should we get Pitt to do it or you do yes, it. Pit luster. <laughs> Pit luster. Oh, I just... I'm not going to do a voice. <laughs> you don't have to. You can do what you want. Okay. Do what I want. Right. Do what I want. Do okay. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Kill... <laughs> Killing these articles, Bainsey. Dialogue right. is one of the... You're welcome. It's one of the tougher aspects of story creation. Explanation point. As Bravo points out, and I've long accepted, dialogue in a story is almost never like real life conversations. Real conversations are like streams of consciousness, full of short, incomplete blurbs, lots of grunts. Uh -huh. and she she wanted that voice yeah. <laughs> and nonverbal cues while, while creating a story. With that kind of dialogue is an interesting challenge. You also have to fill in what a reader would normally pick up in a normal conversation, but can't in a, in a story. Uh, parentheses, only one sense. Parentheses within a parentheses, sigh. <laughs> Instead of live animal, non-linguistic sounds. Parentheses, snort. <clears throat> parentheses, parentheses again. One thing I've noticed <laughs> I do I do in story di dialogue is the characters say the name of whoever... It should be whomever they're talking to much more than anyone would do in a real conversation but it just feels right in the story yeah yeah so we're, we're kind of we're kind of saying the same kind of things you know you gotta kind of edit for you know it can't always be realistic but it's gotta you gotta find that sweet spot yeah you right. do. It, it is a balance but what she said about the um characters saying the names oh my god that helps me when I do the, the, the bloody features I read through these things and I try and work out who the people are because I've, I've got to write yeah. a review and so often characters never say their names in people's things and I just don't know who, who is who yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's only done once on the first page and never again I just don't know what yeah what's going on but um, in real life, you do say people's names, at least to say, hello, Helen, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, it's, right. it's polite. And But when we do our writing, we don't have people saying the, the, the characters' uh, names often. Uh, Kim Lasser does, because she, she's good, but a lot of us don't. And um, I don't know, just for the perspective of someone reviewing your comic or trying to get a handle on who the people are, it's a good idea to, to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, people say bones in the comic a lot. I know that. I, I for yeah. sure I know your your characters do, are name checked because I I featured it <laughs> and I know all the characters' names. Uh, bones, your characters <laughs> as well. At least you you have like the helpful the, like little uh, thing above your comic, don't you? With that. That's the one of the main reasons I did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there like six main characters. I'm like. If there's people who aren't on the top banner who are showing up, you kind of know that they're not the main characters. It's a bit of a cheat, I guess. Oh, but... That's a good idea. I think I'm going to do it myself. 
And Pinky wears her name, so I mean, it's kind of not too hard to. Yeah, you sort of know who you're focused on in that comic. Who is this comic named after? I just can't tell. (laughs) She says the other people's names too, though, like CC and Ace and stuff like that. So that's not hard either. She says that a lot. (laughs) Too much. (laughs) CC. What's a. You're the bad one. (laughs) You're the bad guy. What was there was some anime? Oh, what was it? Where they always say the the person's name. Oh, oh I'm turning Morty. over. You, you know what I'm talking about. We gotta get moving, Morty. Come <laughs> on, Morty. Brilliant. Rick and Morty. That's oh awesome. Oh my god. <laughs> Constantly it, says that's his name. awesome. Morty. Morty. <laughs> I love it. That's <laughs> awesome. Oh, I don't remember now, but. Uh-huh. An Fuck anime. it. Tell Fuck us... it. I've I've seen every anime, so you just give me some background. Just something like, uh, are they schoolgirls? Oh my god, that's like six million animes. No, that doesn't help me. My name is. <laughs> they always make a big deal when I'm saying their names. I noticed that. From all anime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this whole yeah. It's a uh, it's about schoolgirls. Um, and then there's school boy, and um. <laughs> that narrows it down. He gets alien powers, and um, he doesn't have a personality, but his friends have personalities. <laughs> <laughs> but then he has to make sure to beat up the intergalactic bad guy so he could go to school exams and ace them. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That one. That, I know that one. Yeah. That one. Yeah, yeah. My name is Tanaka Yoshida. You can call me Tana. <laughs> That seems like what's what's what is that? I guess it's a Japanese thing. <laughs> it always makes me angry. But anyway, right. <laughs> I love it. It makes me angry. You, you like, wouldn't like Bane's when he's Bane's angry. on the loose. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just big burly Canadian guy just runs up to the poor Japanese anime dude and smacks. Stop no, introducing man. yourself. Stop telling me your name in the short form. I'd like you to call me Yushi. I don't care. <laughs> I'll call you. You can shut the fuck up. <laughs> you should shut up. Yeah. Go, oh, good. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, I love you guys so much. Oh. You're all racist. <laughs> all right. So next up we have Mr. Easy B. Easy B, who is the the um the creator of. Damn it! It's. I, will, I, will, I want to say he's the creator of Easy B, but his comic's not. It's called something else, like something. Um, Atomic Girl? No, what is it? It is. I it's, bought his comic. It's Easy B you, Comics. You, you can presents. just click on his name. His name yeah. is right there. You can just That's click true. on it. He's got two comics. He's got Dude in Distress and Easy Well, that B one comics I haven't read. Presents. Fusion. Yeah. Fusion. Atomic Girl. That's it. Oh, Atomic. yeah. Yeah, Fusion. I should have known that because it's part of uh, Heroes Alliance, I think. Yeah. At least at one point or another. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I love the fact that he uh, contributes to that. So, Mr. Easyby says, Very good topic. And one that tons could be written about. Actually, I hit a word limit so I'll have to break this response in two since dialogue is more important in establishing a character's personality than visual character design I likewise love when when readers read into a character's thinking in reaction to dialogue situations one of the reasons no dialogue and just facial expression or body language can be an effective communicator in visual storytelling few things as a storyteller are more gratifying than seeing readers understand the unspoken things going on in a scene. It shows you've done a good job in creating believable living characters and simply not pawns for a story. And he goes on to say another very important part of dialogue since it's one of the biggest ways of establishing characters and their personalities is to be sure each character is distinguishable by the way he or she speaks and to tweak dialogue accordingly with characterization established by speech patterns 
general diction to make it easier for a simple dialogue to reveal moods or unspoken thoughts uh, through what a character says or doesn't say. If a typically verbose character suddenly gives it short, terse responses, readers immediately know that something's up. Now, this is, this is something that, you know, Putrid Meek comes to mind. You've got very much this tread and bones of people who are have very specific ways of talking. You can distinguish them immediately from the other characters, especially uh, Tread. And Blitzoff as well, which is, uh, um, you know, your latest character. So you instinctively, or by design or whatever, have, you know, done this. You've given your characters distinguishable ways of speaking. Oh, well, thank you. I think a lot of people appreciate too, because, you know, we... We come to know and love the characters more because of that. Yeah, it keeps you coming back. Yeah, it's yeah. it really is. Yeah, something big about it. And like what uh, Easy B says, the um, when something's up and they speak differently, then oh my god, that's a that's a huge kind of a moment. And that happens with Bones. You have him suddenly uh, being more verbose for some reason, and now that's uh. Or, or Tread dropping out of... If, if Tread does, I don't think he ever has dropped out of his more mechanical way of speaking, then suddenly, you know, you know, oh my god, what's happened? So that that's an effective kind of technique, really. Well, thank you. I, I think the only time... I, I, I do remember one, um, one of my favourite Tread moments, actually, is uh, he he's in Bunker City and it's when, you know, everything has gone to hell and he's kind of being cornered by these zomboid bunkerians and um he's fighting his way out he's you know he's 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 stoic as shit until all of a sudden one of them uh stabs him in the thigh with like a broken piece of bone and he straight up goes fuck (laughs) (laughs) yes yes he breaks character Oh yeah, the more mechanical, you know, <laughs> super complex. Just fuck. <laughs> oh, my Treddy, I love him so. His true metal shows through. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Bones? Do you have that with the the character sort of um, breaking character, so to speak? Um. Oh boy. Yeah, I haven't. Man, I got. I would have to think back. I'm sort of not doing as many comics know. right now. But uh, <laughs> well, maybe. I mean, there have been situations where they get scared and and stuff like that, or where they're trying to make an impression. But uh, yeah, I can't think of specific examples offhand. You know, for Pinky TA, um, one of the things I, I've I've always had every time I've been doing this comic for the whole time. I don't know, like over many many years. There's so many different ways I want to approach it and so many different things I want to do and they don't fit in the same space because you can't do everything. I'll do an abstract comic and a realistic one at the same time. It's, you know, but one of the 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 um the things is I've wanted to do uh that kind of thing, have characters speaking in certain ways that fit their characters because that looks good. But one of the other main influences was this uh great writer called uh Jack Vance. And also another writer, um, Philip G. Williamson, I think. And these these are novel writers that wrote great fantasy. But their uh, thing, when they... I I think I've said this before, but their characters, no matter who they are, to the lowliest, like, uh, peasant or the the highest king, they all speak in exactly the same way. Mm. And and that is, every character speaks with incredible erudition, um... They all speak like they're they've got a thesaurus and a dictionary open in front of them, and you know they've been um, doing you know dissertations at Oxford all their lives. You know, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful speech. It doesn't matter if you know they're uh, they they pick up shit for a living or you know if if they're a, um, a rock with a personality. They all have this beautiful way of speaking, which is really bizarre and it, it doesn't make sense. But then you get into it, and it's really cool. And when I was doing Pinky TA, that's what I sort of wanted to do. I didn't want to have any characters be dumb or, um, well, they they could be dumb, but none of them would ever 
uh, be lost for words. They would always be, um, you know, have really good speech and be intelligent and stuff like that. I wanted that to to be the case. I probably haven't. (laughs) But but that was the thing. I I didn't (laughs) want any characters just to be, oh, man, this sucks, dude. Uh, You know, I just wanted to have them to be able to, to express themselves as well as possible because I thought that was so so cool but I, I haven't but yeah that was one of the things I wanted to do but because of that I haven't given them proper characterizations with their you know ways of speaking and stuff that's just how it is oh. <laughs> <laughs> but say so, well I mean oh, I'd, I'd say that that's I mean that's a fun way to experiment with dialogue too yeah yeah if, if you can do that maybe some comic artists have but you know them but they're more skilled than me but one more thing i want to get I, i'm not blowing smoke up your your bum uh pit but uh you've got this um blitz off way of talking is just incredible it's um oh thank you it's so you can blow as much smoke up my bum as you want dude <laughs> but it's, it's so well characterized because He's this man of clay, and you know you you think he's stupid, but he has these very very deep thoughts on life and death, and he speaks in exactly the way you'd expect him to. You know, this very taciturn sort of um, metal looking guy, and he speaks in this very melancholic, uh, considered way, and it fits his character perfectly. So it's, uh, it's well, thank well you. Designed, yeah. So how did you come up with that? Was it always in your mind that he was going to talk that way? Or? No, like, um, to tell you the truth, I didn't really know him that well when I started writing him. Um, I really didn't know too much how he was going to talk. I just kind of, I don't know, like, he just it went along and it, it's some inner voice of mine. I don't know, but he just, okay. yeah, just the way he reacts and stuff. It, he doesn't strike me as somebody who is, is too over. Well, sometimes he is over the top, but um, yeah, I don't know. It just happened. <laughs> I don't it, know how I do anything. It fits him. It just happens. <laughs> yeah, visually, it, it fits him so well. Well, next up we have, oh, Tansreen. Tansi. So I think we'll give that to you, Pitts, because you can do the Tant's voice if you want. You don't have to. You can read it. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay. (laughs) Well, the first thing I'd say is that we never write realistic dialogue, but rather a simulation of realistic dialogue. In real life, people digress, leave hanging sentences, lose train, of thought or speak incorrectly slash incoherently. If we do that in comics or novels, the entire thing collapses and the audience discount disconnects. So by nature, we have to write a concise sentence where often there would be a paragraph or roundabout sentences and pauses and is and the like. The point I need to make is we need to make the dialogue sound realistic. In that sense, we should first determine how the personality of each character would produce turns of phrase of phrase and dialogue. Some people are inherently aggressive. Some are the exact opposite. Some people have a flair for the dramatic and others are stoic in how they speak. So in order to make the dialogue feel genuine and realistic, you need to sort of quantify these traits and keep in mind to switch the tone according to who is talking. I also hit the word limit, so here's the rest. Laffy face. By the way, (laughs) excellent topic. After the tone and style of each character is determined, you need to know how they react to situations and reflect that in their verbal responses. Dialogue between a simulation is on the nose to a degree by nature but in the same time each character might have different strategies of expressing what they want blunt or wordy 
with hints or with remarks, with metaphors or allusions to others. You name it. Explanation point. If dialogue is thus embellished, it becomes too colorful and lush for the audience to feel it's on the nose. Smiley face. <laughs> Gunwald says, the nose knows. <laughs> Junior says, I make bad dialogue. So. <laughs> Dialogue is thus embarrassed, it becomes too colourful and lush for the audience to feel. Okay. That's interesting. That's interesting, yeah. her, her, her deconstruction of it. Because Tance is, is the master. Yeah. Well, she's uh, <laughs> like knowing uh, as much psychology as you can definitely helps, obviously, with writing. With writing people and how they behave, you know, how they handle things. Are they passive aggressive? Are they trying to, you know, divert attention onto other people? Like there's all, there's so many things, like the more you know yeah. about that kind of stuff, the better. Right? Her characters are way more nuanced. Um, they're very nuanced in the way they speak. Yeah. The way they act. Not so much Basil, he's pretty straightforward, but other ones like Orestes um, and the, the German characters are very, very nuanced and, uh, tricky <laughs> there's a lot going yeah. on there <laughs> and the yeah. kids as well so good stuff yeah it's worth reading the nuance too. of course creates um interest you know i mean don't be afraid of it even and nuance doesn't have to mean wordy either nuance can come across in in, in a sentence two sentences you know yeah yeah just by because you. we yeah. all oh go on yeah, because there are certain ways, you know, that you expect somebody to convey something when it's straightforward. Like, I walk to the park. Obviously, I walk to the park. But then, like, if you just change one one word, say I went to the park, that could suggest that I have a different way of going to the park than just walking now that's i mean that's just a little dumb example but like you know you change one word and it can change the meaning of a sentence and then you can put little nuanced things that way so yeah or you, well, basically yeah. You, you use words that have multiple meanings or you make a sentence that, that yeah can have far more than the one meaning which gives it the nuance so yes like like the when the bad guy's saying the, the bad guy doesn't say okay we gotta kill James Bond he says um, we have to deal with the James Bond situation yeah yeah <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if he had a little accident <laughs> <laughs> so I'm stealing from um, I'm stealing from uh, uh, a sketch comedy um, with the uh, God, I can't remember uh, what it's called, but anyway, it's it's a very good way of doing it. Um, that that the bad guy speech. Well, which... I don't know. That seems like terrible villains to me. They're just going to wait for him to have an accident and hope for it. <laughs> That's but dumb. The the thing the thing that is uh, that is ironic about that, and that that was actually what they did. What Baines just said that was that was how they did the comedy sketch. One guy said, "We've oh. got to be more direct <laughs> because we we waited six months for the, the last guy to have an accident and nothing happened." <laughs> Next time we have to learn to say, "We'll kill James Bond." But uh, the ironic thing is that real criminals actually do speak that way because. If they're caught on record actually saying, oh, I want to murder this guy, then they can be indicted and, you know, jailed. So what they say is when they want to kill someone, they use code words and phrases and say, well, yeah, wouldn't it be good yeah. if he had an accident? And that way there's no direct evidence against them when uh, in court. And that has happened. <laughs> so... Yeah. Right. I have heard, have heard audio of, like, someone, like, either an undercover cop or someone who's been compromised or whatever who are trying to get the other person on the phone or whatever to admit that they you know they've hired him to kill somebody or whatever and it's it's really funny like how they really push to get a direct yeah. sort of comment out of them and people just kind of talk around it 
yeah. <laughs> it's it's hilarious. <laughs> you think, oh my god, I'm going to get to see hear real gangsters speak about the real things they didn't did they did, and you listen to it and you can't work out what the hell they're saying because you've got, mm. you've got no idea. Ah. <laughs> uh. I love that. So yeah, speaking in riddles and stuff like that, and it's actually more naturalistic than you think. Nuance. It's it's what makes the world go around, and uh, it'll give you a long career in organized crimes. <laughs> That's right. You won't get caught, baby. <laughs> uh, so, do you want to read out Mister A Avart, Mister Baines? Avart. Who does, Mark. I believe, The Gloom. Avante! Oh, yeah. Beautiful comic. Fantastic yes. comic. Excellent topic, Baines. Now I'm doing voices, just as we're ending. I'm not a big <laughs> fan of including too much dialogues. I rarely put more than two balloons in one panel, mostly for aesthetic reasons. That's what I noticed. Like, why are there so many balloons in this comic? Oh, he means dialogue balloons. <laughs> So, I need to include more panels in a chapter to tell my story. But for me, it works because I think it's also important when the characters, what the characters don't say, and here's where body language comes in. Yes, oh, okay. I yeah, agree. yeah, yeah. So, he's got the body language doing most of the. Di well, that's, that's the thing we've mentioned before because comics are uh, a visual meaning where a visual medium where the images are part of the writing so they do have a role not only in telling the story but it's also um, explaining the speech as well so if you could do that if you're skilled enough then you know it can take a bit of the burden though that does take a bit of skill doesn't it i mean it's not easy. It definitely yeah the more um sophisticated i mean the more uh well what am i talking about it's not just body language and stuff like that. It's you know choice of camera angle, panels to sort of pull your eye around and make you focus on the right thing. Yeah, and make it look like you know it it has the right vibe and all that kind of stuff. So you kind of get what's going on and you feel what's going on. Like that's like advanced stuff. Yeah, color, shadow, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, it can it can really help move. Well, uh, add to the dialogue, so enhance. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, it, an expression, of course. That's that's a simple thing. It's an obvious thing. But yeah, facial expression. So much. It's all part of it. Yeah. I remember when I was um, first starting Pinky TA. I all my characters' expressions were like you know, uh, like resting bitch face. You know, they, I don't think they even open their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I learned how to do like uh, expression and stuff like that, and it just helps so much. It's man. mine is like dialogue based for the for a lot of in a lot of ways, but I have to say like my favorite pages I've done have been zero dialogue or almost nothing. Okay, yeah. those have been like my favesies, <laughs> and a lot of people liked. Yeah, because you can you interpret your own dialogue from the way that uh, it looks and and the, the the setup which is always fun yeah, yeah. or just it you just focus I love on that kind of shit yeah it's great it's, uh... you don't need to take your reader by the hand and like you know i mean i mean we've already kind of beat this over the head but like you don't have to explain everything you know what i mean like yeah i love it when people yeah. Just let the reader make their own interpretation. Yeah, oh, definitely. Same here. That's the best. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, it does take a little. Uh, you know, you have to have a little confidence, just a little, and to, skill um, to do it as to well. To do that, some skill, a lot of confidence, like just to trust yourself that people will will get it enough. You know. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't sort of just imagine that people are going to get it. You have to know what you're doing. If if you can get it, if you, if you're not confident, get get someone and test it on them first. Because sometimes it falls <laughs> flat. So. Yeah. When it works, it works. Uh, yeah, or just do it because another part of it is people are going to have different interpretations of people. So oh. I guess that's kind of what I'm getting at when I'm saying like, 
using dialogue to explain everything and make sure everyone understands like every nuance and everything. Like leaving some ambiguity is is okay. It actually is way better. Absolutely. I'm I'm just speaking from the point I agree of view 100%. of percent. Someone who's who's reviewed a hell of a lot of comics and read through them, and sometimes the writers mm-hmm. are very good in the way they they do just that kind of thing, and you don't know what the crap's going on, and right to the detriment of the yeah. story. So sometimes that does happen. It's a good point. Yeah, there is a like skill to it. You have to like it's work to do it. I guess. Yeah. yeah. So it's like you don't don't overly um, control it, you know. Yeah. Like if if it makes see if it makes sense, but at the same time, I, I think it's the same thing with with visual art too. You know, um, the harder you try and control everything, the more cardboard it comes out, and the less the less. Um, mystery or intrigue that you you have. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, you uh, the classic thing is there's you, nothing to interpret then. Yeah, interpret. Uh, yeah. The classic thing is the uncanny valley. Uh, the more characterized something is, the more stylized it is. The more you forgive. So if it's not too realistic, then it's it's you you fill in the blanks and it becomes more real. But the closer to reality something is. The more work you put into it, then you reach this valley where it gets way less realistic and it, it becomes worse. So unless you make it completely, absolutely realistic, you know, you you, you make it absolutely one hundred percent, then it's it's never going to work. It's going to be total crap. So, so that's an interesting <laughs> interesting yeah. phenomena. The more you try to make something real, or you know affect something the worse yeah. it gets <laughs> right <laughs> you gotta just just yeah. stay away from the valley <laughs> I, I never got cartoons that were trying realistic for the sake of being realistic you know what I mean like like I guess it's cold to kind of see how far you can push it and how realistic you make you can make something and what happens when it becomes super realistic that i get that's cool but like realistic for the sake of just having i don't know i'm, I'm getting into something else i'm going to shut up because that's not even dialogue but <laughs> yeah. okay. i didn't say anything no no it, it does make <laughs> sense it, 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 it does so you're looking at say 3d animation stuff um, i think final fantasy was one that did this um they... yeah kind of famously right they come sort of more odd looking and uh, yeah, Golden Compass. Mm-hmm. Too realistic. No, no, not Golden Compass. Okay. Um, uh, Polar Express. Polar Express. Yeah. It. yeah, Dead Eyes. Dead Eyes. <laughs> dead Eyes. <laughs> dead Eyes. <laughs> uh, but then, you then you eyes. still have the other end of the spectrum, right? Like either extreme can be off-putting. Like I've, like I haven't seen tangled or frozen or anything like that although i've watched all most of the other disney movies because like i know that they're they have acclaim and stuff like that but for some reason those eyes with their jet those faces with the giant eyes like i know they're super expressive but like it's almost over fucking expressive like the eyes Too the much. eyes just right fucking there it's just <laughs> I, I don't like it man and then it makes the body seem off proportion and shit and like I don't like it. Yeah. Oh, really? Disney okay. goes a yeah. bit overboard. Yeah, they, people say anime, but oh my god, Disney. They yeah, did it first, and they did it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, last up we have Amelia P, who is, of course, the author of King's Club, which is the featured comic and the featured music. Oh my god, she's getting everything in this quack cast. Yeah. <laughs> and she's the last one. Jeez, she's just oh my god. She's she's also left some very nice comments on putrid meat and blitz off at putrid meat is, at least. So thank you very much. It's like she rolled a six and then a six and then a whole bunch of sixes. So she's, so she's Satan. <laughs> <laughs> Satan of the sixes. Satan of the perfect roll. I don't play Dungeons and Dragons, but <laughs> apparently that's a good thing to roll lots of sixes. Anyway, so Amelia P. and she says, um, 
Oh, right. She's quoting you, Bones. Any thoughts on what makes good or bad dialogue? And she says, bad dialogue for me when no information or mood or character or, you know, is delivered by dialogue if the characters open their mouths. This has got to be worth it. But rarely I find dialogues bad. Very good topic. Thanks for the tips above. Um, I, I'm not sure I got that. Could you guys, do you know what she's saying there? Um, maybe I'm. Thinking... Well, there has to be a point yeah. to it. It has to be like some yeah. information, like story information, or some kind of mood or atmosphere or character being revealed. Oh, okay, okay. There Bad has to be dialogue a point for me. very general, but colon. true. I didn't see the yeah. colon. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Thank you guys for uh, straightening out. Yeah, I didn't see the colon there, so that was down to me. Um, right. How could you see a colon? It's inside the stomach. <laughs> That's a new uh, character I'm working on. Oh, thank you. Do it. Enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when no information is... The... That's that's a good point. Okay, so... um, That ties into the thing of, like, naturalistic versus artificial. Even if it sounds good or sounds right, it's artificial. You know, if it's serving yeah. a story, it's yes. got a... There's yeah. a point to it, you know. And you don't want to have read a whole Absolutely. bunch of dialogue and it doesn't push the story anywhere so oh that's the worst that's the, the worst <laughs> and not just that we'll see i like how amelia qualifies it because um it you don't have to necessarily push the story but like for instance i like tarantino dialogue but you at least get characterization out of it yeah. if the story isn't going forward you know you like that's so so that's why i like that she keeps it kind of broad that you get something yeah. out of it and part of that, I mean, you kind of sit there and go, duh, but think about, you know, times that perhaps, and I'm speaking to the listeners out there, like all three of you, <laughs> but uh, two of them are, are faint than us, but um, yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, think about the times that you're sitting there trying to write dialogue and how many times you might have been compelled just to have a character in the background or if the other characters, main characters, say something just for the point of having them say something. And sometimes you have to kind of make yourself not do that. Don't have somebody responding or, or saying something just because you want them to, but there's nothing worthwhile to come out of it. Don't feel obligated to make a character <laughs> talk, I guess is what I'm saying. That wasn't that funny. But um, <laughs> don't feel obligated to put in dialogue, I guess, is yeah, yeah, another. Yeah. It's it's small talk for small talk's yeah. sake. That that's the that's the uh, the analog of, of what you're saying. So when some idiot says, "It's a it's a cold day we're having, isn't it?" Uh, yeah, it is. Uh... <laughs> so what are you doing for the weekend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you're trying to work up to the the scene or something like that. That would okay. that would be like more natural dialogue, and it. it pretty much never works uh the tarantino thing yeah i i totally agree yeah, like that's well, that is doing that. something that's that gives you that's good idea. stuff like that's great that's creating a, a mood it's yeah creating a mood to telling you that it's this character sort of is someone pulls who, like, you in these two yeah. characters are people who like to babble on about crap in their spare yeah. time and uh says you know they're they're kind of fun weird guys and it's and they argue about these inconsequential things even though they're murderers so that uh gives you a hell of a lot of characterization there and information about the story even though it doesn't yeah. seem like yeah that. he i read tarantino was talking about that and saying like he wants to show the scenes he wanted to show the scenes in movies you, that you never see so it's a gangster movie so these are like after the camera cut or before it cut in this is what you saw yeah. But it's not like how you do in nice day and stuff like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um one of the things I love to do, uh speaking of dialogue and speech, is when I've got a group scene, which I've done a few times, is oh, so I, have, I have the <laughs> I have the main character speaking and, you know, delivering the dialogue that's gonna move things forward. And then I have all these characters in the background in the crowd, just there's snippets of conversation. So I didn't think I she like was that. gonna do it that way. Yeah, which is it's so much fun because you can 
you can hint at so much backstory and different aspects of what's happening just with all these little uh, hints and bits of information. So you've give carte blanche to sort of just go ape, ape shit you know you can, you can do <laughs> as, as much hinting as possible and you know it doesn't have to be connected because they're, they're part of a crowd so you're only hearing snippets so you don't have to do full conversations you have to you can just do bits of the conversations that's the important part without a beginning a middle or an end you know whichever part of it you want that hint at different things it's fun to do. So I yeah. recommend doing yeah, that to people. Cool. I recommend people to. I recommend that people try that. That's what I mean. <laughs> I recommend doing that to people. No, I do. That sounds <laughs> sexual and weird. <laughs> Subjecting people. I uh, guess speaking about grammar and dialogue and conversation. Yeah, learn how to speak correctly. <laughs> That's an important thing. Uh, often, I will I will actually own my speech because I'll realise that I've got some weird syntax stuff going on there, and I have to rearrange the words to make them sound more natural or more expected. Or yeah. you can go the other way too. You can you can have like a normal sentence, and you can change some of the words around, and it can sound a little bit odd that way, and it can sound more novel and interesting because you've phrased it slightly wrongly. Yeah. That's good. Like instead of saying, where are we going today? You'd, you'd have someone say, um, going where are we today? <laughs> not not, <laughs> not in, a, in a Yoda kind of idiotic way, but, you know, mix it up a little bit. Wherefore do we go on this fine day? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've, we've, we're just over the hour here. This has been a, a fantastic dialogue cast, guys. You've been brilliant. Thank you. We Yay. Yeah, the quota cast. Yes, thank you for all the comments, everybody. Yeah. Wicked. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's give a, a recap. So we've got Amelia P, uh, Av Avart, Albino or Albino Ginger, I like to say albino. Uh, gum wars. <laughs> Tanzarine. Uh, Easy B. Kim Lost. SAB, I think it is. Oh, you're right. Is SAB. It? Yeah. Oh, damn it. Uh, Kim Luster. Oh, there's an ocean, of course. Um, Bravo. And yeah, that's all we had. Fantastic. Sweet. Yes. Neat. Thank you, everybody. Grazie. They have been thanked. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye.